Hi, I'm Roseanne and welcome to my garden. It's late September and the garden continues to evolve. Right now, lush green foliage tends to dominate the garden, but there are still plenty of flowering annuals and perennials, especially native perennials, that are still blooming. And that's important. It's not only pretty to look at, but having a constant buffet of flowers from spring through fall provides a constant food source of nectar and pollen for our native pollinators. Let's take a look around the garden and I'll show you some of my favorite and special places, which also happen to be some of the favorite places of butterflies and bees. Let's begin in the front yard. Foundation plantings should be welcoming to scale and look good through the seasons. This is a strawberry vanilla hydrangea tree. I love the horizontal branching habit. We prune it every March when the tree is dormant to keep it the right size for the space. Here's a picture of it in the summer before the panicles started changing color. Isn't vanilla strawberry a perfect name? To add a vertical element to the planting area, we have an eight foot tall wrought iron trellis that is host this year to climbing snapdragons. I like that the vine is rather airy, at least in this location, and you can still see the form of the trellis. As with all of my annual vines, I started the climbing snapdragons from seeds indoors this spring. As a mid-layer planting, I have Henry Hudson roses. They finished flowering for the season, but they were beautiful and fragrant when they were blooming. Meanwhile, the sedum is in its peak and the bees absolutely love it. Let's move to the backyard by way of our side yard garden. It's pretty interesting. It's only seven feet wide and it packs a lot of punch. Above me, I have blue moon wisteria growing. It's not blooming right now, but it was spectacular when it did. Do be cautious with wisteria, however, and don't let their beauty seduce you unless you're willing to commit to regular pruning. Without regular hard pruning, they can take hold where you may not want them. As we enter the garden path of stepping stones and Irish moss, Immediately to the left is an incredibly popular native turtle head plant. It blooms for at least four to six weeks and likes full sun and moist soil, although mine can get quite dry at times. I love how the bees completely crawl inside the flower and emerge seconds later. Continuing down the path, I have trees suited for narrow spaces that help to keep the eye focused down the path and away from our neighbor's house. Further down, I have another patch of pink turtle head plant in our green wall of apple trees. Isn't this hydrangea spectacular? It's called Twist and Shout, and uh, sometimes I think it looks like it's from outer space. It's just so exotic and beautiful. The next plant I'd like to show you is the Chocoholic Bugbane. It's the tall, feathery, plumed plant on the right of the path. It does well in moist, shady areas. I love the slender, deep, chocolate-colored stems and the deep green, leathery leaves. The pollinators seem to love it, too. The path continues to meander, surrounded by lush green foliage, until it opens up to the backyard. Here's a view of the path from a different angle. Most years I use containers of colorful annuals to brighten up the patio area. The lollipop-shaped shrubs are spilled wine wygela. I like the slight formality or structure they add to the area. Along a small path north of the patio, we have more sedum. This is Matrona, and it has delightful pink stems rather than green. It needs to be divided regularly or it tends to get very floppy. Here it's intermingling with Amara impatience. You'll see these impatience sprinkled all over the garden. 
I just love the reliable summer long color of annual bedding plants. Next to the sedum is my pride and joy, Carol Mackey Daphne. The beautiful little leaves rimmed in white are totally alluring. I've had my Daphne for many years and it seems to like this garden. It has a reputation as being difficult to grow in zone four. I consider myself very lucky. This has to be one of my favorite vines. I grow it year after year on this same support. It's called a cup and saucer vine or, or also cathedral bells. It grows by little beautiful little tendrils which grab onto the twine of the support. The flowers are undeniably delicate and beautiful and you can see the little cup in the saucer, hence the uh, common name cup and saucer vine. I grow these from seed every year and I start them indoors and then I plant the seedlings outside uh, to get a jump start on the summer. They start blooming about August uh, every year and continue until the frost. Isn't this a great bench? My husband created this work of art a few years ago using over two tons of natural stone. It's probably my favorite spot where we sit and relax and take breaks from gardening. Oddly enough, the cool temperature of the stone is very soothing, especially on hot days. Here's a little arrangement of Japanese painted ferns set off against a stone outcropping with fossilized ferns. I think that natural stone outcroppings in moderation make lovely focal points. I love unusual shrubs and trees and this is certainly one of my treasures. Look at the crazy corkscrew branches of this contorted filbert tree. Another beautiful fall flowering plant is Datura Mattel, also known as Devil's Trumpet. They're only hardy in the very warmest of climates, such as zones 9 or 10, so I consider Datura an annual plant here in zone 4. In our garden, the blooms open around noon and stay open for the rest of the day. Some people call these moonflowers because they bloom in the evening. The pure white blooms are easily 6 inches long and 4 inches wide. I always love having white flowers in the garden and the detour begins flowering shortly after my calla lilies are done flowering for the season. I consider detour a very easy, low maintenance plant that likes sun but can handle partial shade. I harvest seeds every fall from these seed pods. After carefully picking a few green pods, I let them dry out indoors. After a few weeks, the pot explodes and the ripe seeds are ready to store until spring. Detour are poisonous, so please take care if you have small children or pets. Moving to the back area of the garden by our garden shed, we have colorful impatience brightening the scene and our purple Jackmani clematis is still blooming. The Irish moss between the pavers is going strong and the charming love in a puff vine or cardiospermum is full of little green puffs. I harvest the seeds every fall and start them indoors every spring. Normally I like to switch out the annual vines every year for variety, but this is one vine that I keep planting next to the shed door because I love the look of it. Isn't this just a charming part of the garden? It's on the south side of our garden shed. And uh, from seeds, I grew the uh, climbing snapdragon, which you saw in our front yard. The bees love it. And I'm also growing big blue salvia. Now I grew these from seed this year. I think I got 10 seeds to a packet. 
and six of them germinated so I consider that pretty okay but the flowers are just beautiful and they're bee, uh, they're bee magnets too they grow tall they're strong they don't need staking and I will definitely be buying seeds for these again next year and um, just peeking out throughout the big blue salvia I have Irish poet tassel flower again I grow these from seed as well they're just they're just so sweet uh, intermingled the orange with the purple I, I really like the combination this is Anna's hyssop and it too is a pollinator magnet uh, right now the flowers are beginning to be spent but there are some there are some bees still around it Here's the very last blooming calla lily in the entire garden. Next to it is the hardy and long blooming Thai pink jade phlox with the most beautiful hue. A late bloomer, to be sure, is this gorgeous white anemone. It's just starting to bloom now and look at all those buds. I have it growing in partial shade, although I understand it can handle full sun as long as it doesn't get too dry. Turf grass is an important part of our garden. The large areas of deep green come down the garden. Plus, this large grassy area provides a place for us to entertain our friends and our dog Dolly. Ordinarily, I'd be showing you heaps of blue morning glories on this morning glory vine. Unfortunately, it's been really sparse with the flowers this year, and I believe that's because I planted the uh, seedlings in too rich a soil. Morning glories like uh, not a lot of moisture and not very fertile soil. So I'm still really pleased with the vertical look in the garden and the lush green foliage though but I probably won't plant morning glories in this spot next year. The last area of the garden I'd like to share with you today is our woodland garden. The graceful arching branches of the Solomon seal look at home with the other native plants. The brilliant red seed pods to the right of the path are jack in the pulpit. For the most part, I consider it a special plant and I let it grow wherever it wants to. It's been successfully multiplying in this area for many years. I've shown you many parts of our garden and most of them had combinations of annuals and native and non-native perennials. Because of that diversity, I've extended the flowering season. I'm happy and the pollinators are happy. I hope you enjoyed your walk around the garden with me and seeing all the butterflies and bees hard at work. Thanks for watching.